Hello, everyone. Um, this is Tim Bump again, and I'm here with Kathleen Carroll to talk a little bit about choosing a residency. And we're hoping to be joined by Rochelle Dumb, but we were having a little uh, technical difficulties getting her set up. So um, she may join us here in just a minute and help us with the presentation. But without further ado, Kathleen. I just froze now, so maybe I'm having technical difficulties too. Are we good to go? We're good to go. Great. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. I apologize if we do have some breaking up here. Um, but my name's Kathleen. I am based out of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I work for Hanger Clinic there, and um, I'm one of the I will be discussing choosing a residency along with Rochelle, who it looks like just joined. Rochelle, are you in? In now. Awesome. We are, we are live. We are going. Um, do you want to just share where you're where you're located currently? Um, I am in Baltimore, Maryland. I work for a private practice called Dinkmeyer Prosthetics. Oh no, Rochelle. Hold on. Okay, honey, go away. You're... All right, sorry. We heard you you work for Dankmeyer. Yes, I'm in Baltimore. Sorry, guys. Lots of technical difficulties. Okay, I think I'm in, though. Anything else that, <laughs> that I need? Nope. Okay. I think we're good to go. I'm going to switch slides here. Uh, so a couple things that we will go through tonight um, are what types of clinics are out there in terms of selecting a residency site, um, a little bit of discussion on the different residency tracks and the different timelines, and then we'll end with some general considerations, things you should take into account as you are choosing that site. All right. Um, so just some general information. Certainly this is the NCOPE resident fair. And so as you're choosing your residency site, you will want to make sure that they are in fact NCOPE accredited. Um, if you have a location you've worked with closely in the past and maybe they haven't had a resident before, it's not impossible to have that site become an accredited site. Uh, you're just going to want to make sure you start that process early. Um, so there's lots of time to process the documentation um, and paperwork needed to get that site up and running. Um, Rochelle, do you want to talk a little bit briefly about the different site variations? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a number of different, of different types of residencies. We'll go into more of the details in the next, in the upcoming st uh, slides. Um, but things that you want to look out for, um, some residencies are more clinical in nature, some are, res are research-based residencies. Um, a lot of residency programs have a lot of different, um, have residents that start at different times. Maybe they have just one resident at a time, or maybe they have four in a cohort. Um, then obviously you want to look for a mentor or a a practice that has mentors that kind of match your learning style best. Um, so some some clinicians, some mentors are going to be very hands on. Others will be more just kind of let you do your own thing and learn at your own pace. Um, so figuring out what your what your own learning style is um, so that you can find a site that will work best with that. Um, and this kind of leads into the next part. Some will let you be a little bit more independent earlier on. Um, others have a more structured uh, program where you have a couple of months of more didactic learning um, and more supervision during those first six six months or so. Um, and then you're independent for the rest of your residency. It just depends on how, they are, um, how the curriculum is set up. Um, and then of course, some residencies are set up for you to continue on as an employee after your residency. Some may not. Um, I did my resident one of my residencies at Michigan, and you do your residency there, and then you move on somewhere else. Um, maybe the opportunity later to come back and work for them, but they really want you to do your residency and then move on somewhere else to get more training. 
Is you, Rochelle? I think it's freezing a little bit. <laughs> okay, right. we're back. We're back. Okay. Um. So let me make sure. Yes, we are. We're good. Uh. So as Rochelle was talking about, there's a lot of different variations in the type of facility that you could be at. Um, Rochelle has actually had the experience of doing a residency in both types of settings. Um, and I sort of have, but in a different extent. So um, I'm going to touch base more on the private side of things, and then um, I'll pass it over to Rochelle to talk about more of a hospital-based setting. Um, but when you're working for a private company, uh, you there's so many different variations in the type of location. So it could be a really tiny office with Rochelle alluded to the fact that some offices are ready to hire after residency and they might actually have a resident with the intention of hiring on afterwards. Um, so that's always something to keep in mind if you want some longevity in that location. Um, again, uh, in terms of the like type of location, if it's a working for a private company, you might be more involved in like the marketing sides of things, making sure um, that you're building that business. In a hospital, a lot of business kind of comes to you because you're naturally in that setting. If you're in the outpatient, um, you might have to do a little bit more work to get your patients to your front door. So something to think about there. Um, and then, uh, certainly, if you work for a really large company like Hangar, for example, uh, there's like things like Hangar Live, which is a big education um, fair during that you'll have a chance to attend at some point. We'll see. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about hospital settings. So like I said, I did my residency, my orthotics residency at the University of Michigan. Um, I did have the opportunity to work in a number of different locations throughout the hospital. Um, so you do a, res a rotation in the actual main hospital building, but also at some of the satellite locations around, um, around the area. And then we also had one main outpatient building. Um, so even though we were technically part of the large hospital system, we still had somewhat exposure to what it would be like in a smaller practice. Um, so one of the offices I worked in just had one other clinician. Um, and then the, obviously the main office had a lot of clinicians in the same place, full scale lab, everything like that. Um, another thing to consider is with a big hospital system, oftentimes you're drawing patients from a large, uh, a, a more vast geographical region. Um, so you may see more complicated cases potentially, depending on what that hospital draws um, to that particular area and what kind of, um, what their specialties are and that sort of thing. Um, I, there's definitely a, a large multidisciplinary approach in a hospital setting just because there's access to, um, you have your surgeons on in the same hospital setting, your physicians, everything like that. Um, but I will say that even in private practice, there are ways to build really solid multidisciplinary care as well. Um, so just where I work now, um, I, I am in a private practice, but we work very closely with a hospital system. Um, so it doesn't, working for a hospital system or working for private, um, one doesn't necessarily negate um, having multidisciplinary access. Um, and then, yeah, the last part here, the charting system. So in the hospital system, we definitely had better access to um, patients' full charts. So things like scoliosis, it was a lot easier to manage because we had access to the physicians, we had access to their x-rays, that sort of thing um, right away. It's a little bit more challenging in a private setting, depending on what. Um... All right. So next up are the different types of residency tracks that you can do. So there's the clinical track versus the research track. Um, so if you do a clinical track, each quarter you complete a, uh, one of the quarterly activities. So things like a critically assessed or appraised topic, journal club, a case presentation, some sort of in-service or a presentation at you know a larger arena, whether that be grand rounds or maybe even something as um, like the Academy's national meeting. Um, so the nice thing about the clinical track is that um, you're continuing to learn, but you don't necessarily have the same pressure as producing an, uh, a product as you might with the research track. 
Um, the clinical track is definitely the most common type of residency, just because, again, the ease of access to it. But I know a number of people who go into the field with a great intention of doing some research, and that's a priority. And if that's a priority for you, then the research track could be a really awesome option. Um, and Rochelle, I believe you have some experience with that. Yes. So I actually did a research residency in Michigan and I did a clinical residency at Dankmeyer. Um, but as far as the research side of things go, um, the way it's set up is that you have um, you'll start off at the beginning of your residency. If you don't have an idea already, um, hopefully your site already has some options that previous residents have done. Um, potentially you could piggyback off of something that someone else has started and you can continue it from there. Or maybe there's another clinician that is working on some research. Um, but having an idea earlier on in the residency is really helpful. Um, and then from there, you have quarterly reviews. Um, so maybe that's you give a presentation in your office. Maybe you present somewhere else partway through the research. Um, and then it culminates in kind of a final thesis at the end. Um, maybe that will end up getting published somewhere, or maybe you can present at a, a national meeting at some point. Um, but you definitely spend a good chunk oh, of your time in, in that research. Um, there's a question here. Um, oh, regarding a research-based residency, do you think there's a benefit to clinical practice with having that experience? Um, I, I think there can be. It depends on what your what your focus is. Um, so my my research was on cranial remolding helmets, and I was looking at the the temperature change um, as a result of wearing a helmet. Um, so I think that it was it was useful information for me to have, and through doing the research, I was able to booster my care my care. Um, I don't necessarily, it, it kind of depends on what your focus is. Um, if you have that desire to do research, to contribute to the field, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, but if you're really focused on that clinical side, um, then I would I would stay in a more clinical residency. Um, it's, it's really tough if you don't have an idea going into a, re a research residency because you just don't have enough time to complete it. Um, another question. Yeah, can you do an... Um, a research orthotic residency and a clinical prosthetic residency or vice versa. I believe you have to do all, all one or the other. Kathleen, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, yeah, I think that that's actually a great question. And it kind of leads into the next topic in terms of the timeline. Yes. I think if you do, if you do two different residencies, if you do the 12 month residency where you do 12 months in orthotics and 12 months in prosthetics or vice versa, then you have the ability to do one um, clinical based and one or um, research based because they're two distinct experiences. If you're doing the 18 month, on the other hand, I believe you'd have to choose one versus the other. Um, so that's going to, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, then um, I would definitely check that out beforehand. Um, but kind of going into those two different timelines, uh, again, the 12 month option, you're, you're fully invested in that one discipline. Um, but the question that T tends to come up is, you know, what does the second residency look like? A lot of uh, locations, especially if you're continuing on in the same company, might have might say, wow, let's have you do at least some of your time practicing your first um, residency topic. So like, for example, if you did orthotics for your second residency, um, maybe you'll do two days a week of just seeing orthotic patients and then three days a week as your prosthetic residency. Um, so that is something that can happen, um, especially if it's a place where you're staying on within the same company. So definitely those are good questions to ask as you are making the, your decisions about things. Um, for the 18 month residency, it's gonna be a quicker completion time for sure. You're, you're six months advanced um, and that's gonna be a great option for you if you're someone who um, isn't kind of uh, doesn't have concerns about, you know, taking back-to-back -back board exams or, um, you know, is, likes the mix of things. So 
there is a requirement that you spend a minimum of 40% of time in each discipline. So not all offices see orthotics and prosthetics evenly. So you want to just make sure that the location that you're at is seeing things in a good proportion. Uh, Rochelle, did you have any other comments on the residency timeline? Yeah, I think you kind of uh, hit the nail on the head with that one. You want to make sure that for your residency time that you're getting decent exposure in both disciplines. Um, so I, I don't know if we talk about this later in the presentation, but some residency sites don't have as much of a mix as other locations, um, especially some of the smaller private practices. So you do want to make sure that if you are doing a combined residency, that you will get enough in each particular area. Um, and for your residency, this is really your time to learn, um, to build for your career. Um, so I would highly recommend that you get the broadest amount of exposure as possible, even if you think that you want to focus in one particular area in the future, but this is really your time to learn. All right. Um, we do have a, another question um, and it says for second residencies, are we going to have to go through applications, interviews and the hiring process again? And is that skipped if we continue with the same site? Uh, so that is a great question. And if you are in fact going to a different location, you will have to go through kind of all of that all over again. Um, so uh, Rochelle, I'm guessing that you did have to do that when you went from yes. interviewing for Michigan to interviewing for your prosthetics residency. Yes. So started that interviewing process around February. So I started my residency in June or July, I think. Um, so by that next February, I was already interviewing for my next residency. Yeah. So I, on the other hand, I did my residencies both through Hangar and I switched like geographic locations. I went from one office to another that was about 15 minutes away and I did not have to do all of the those processes all over again. I certainly had to fill my NCOPE paperwork, but because I was staying on with the same company, there was a nice, easy transition for that. So um, just depends on, you know, what your choices are. Uh, we've got about three more minutes here because Tim extended our session nicely. Um, so just to t uh, jump in on a couple other things. Um, when you are looking at a site, you're going to want to think about what kind of what the fabrication looks like. If you are someone who wants to leave your residency with the skills of being able to provide an orthosis or prosthesis from start to finish, including fabrication, you'll want to look for a place that has a on site fab. Um, a lot of places now are using more central fab. And um, and that's kind of the trend within the field. But if you want those hand skills, definitely make that a priority in choosing your residency site. Um, the Rochelle talked about in the beginning, again, the number of practitioners there, how many people you'll have a chance to learn from. Um, and then the next one is the patient population. Is it a pediatric most? Is it predominantly pediatric? Do they see or are you going to end up seeing a lot of maybe vascular, older patients? Um, if it's a prosthetics residency, will you have a chance to see a hip dysartic um, or some of the more rare types of um, diagnoses? Um, and let's see, I don't want to take up all the time. Rochelle, do you have any um, comments on the last three? Yeah, I mean, I talked already about access to physicians and therapists for interdisciplinary care. Um, as far as on-call goes, this can look a very different depending on your residency site. Um, where I'm at right now, we have during the day on-call. Um, so there's nothing after work, no weekends. Um, when I was at the hospital, we had on-call once, the residents were on-call once a weekend, or what, sorry, once a month per weekend. Nope. Let me try that again over the weekend, once a month. Um, so it just, it looks different. Um, sometimes the, uh, the hospital systems, you probably have more traditional on call, um, but just something to look out for. Um, and then some, some locations may have a non-compete in place for their residents, um, just depends on the site. And you may wanna do a little bit of research um, ahead of time on that, just to see what the requirements are for your particular site, especially if you want employment at that location after the fact. 
Um, there was a question about what responsibilities are held by an on-call resident. I think Tim's going to kick us out soon, uh, but answer that really quickly. Um, we were, there was always a supervising clinician with us as well for the on-call, um, but it was simple things like a uh, if it was a measure for your TLSO um, or providing cast boot, that sort of thing. Um, but there was always supervision. Great. Thank you guys for your presentation and uh, everybody for your questions. These were great.